everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is the birthday boy, Mr. Oh. Dennis Zen. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this special day, my big 4 birthday. We also have a show to do, yeah. Collider Movie Talk, so uh, let's see who else is on this panel. Also here is Mark Ellis. You know I'm here, Dennis, and I, it, out of the goodness of my heart, I brought you these donuts, I got <laughs> you the beer, I, I brought Dennis all the presents that you see before you, nobody else. Yeah, yeah right. And it's the return of Red Shirt Guy, Mr. Red John Roca. <laughs> who, who almost got axed before the, this show. I just wanted a donut, that's yeah. all. I just wanted, he, I just because I... tried to shove me aside. So, so just to be clear, Sinead yeah. got me the wonderful donuts. She did. Uh... Wendy got me this nice Taiwanese breakfast. Perry got me this nice uh, Game of Thrones beer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you were like trying to shove me aside. Listen, <laughs> I hadn't had breakfast. I wanted a donut. Okay. I, I just, I, I momentarily forgot it was It was, was very birthday. George Costanza of you just throwing <laughs> everybody out of your Fire! path. Yeah. Uh, so before we get into the show, yeah, I want to mention, yeah, how, how uh, I rang in my 40th. Uh, right. I was actually with, with you over there, Ellis, Christian, yeah. John Schnapp. John Campia, Cody over there, a yeah. bunch, uh, Sasha Pearl Raver. Uh, Everyone we, but me. Yes, yeah. Yes. Well, you weren't yes. invited. That's right. We we saw <laughs> Independence Day <laughs> resurgence last night, and. Uh, Mark, uh, what, what was your take on that movie? The fact that we did invite John Roca <laughs> to Independence Day 2 means that we care about him. Yeah. Because you did not have to suffer like the rest of us. It was one of the worst movie experiences I've ever had wow. in a theater. That movie is so garbage awful, I can't even put it into words how many times I wanted to get up and leave the theater. But I stayed because we were celebrating Dennis's birthday. And I took a nap. <laughs> Multiple times during that movie, it's horrible. Yeah, do we have a picture uh, of of all of us? This is after the after the thing. This is probably oh. the most fun we had the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> was taking this picture. <laughs> so that that will tell you what that that, that wasn't a, the only thing I thought though. That's Watching awesome. the like, I was sitting there in the movie. I was like, oh, fuck, checking my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, look, you're turning forty. It can only go up from here, right? Like, like it, it's so bad, it can only go up. Not many people have the rocks to start their 40th birthday at, at the bottom. Yeah. And you I, did I started that. at the bottom. So there's literally nothing that could happen to you for the rest of your life that will be as bad as the beginning of your 40th birthday. Yeah. It's all sunshine and roses from here on out for Mr. Dennis then. <laughs> all right. That's enough with uh, Independence Day. Oh. Shanae, what's the fir first uh, topic? Though Sony did well financially for themselves with the first two installments of The Amazing Spider-Man, each taking in well over $700 million worldwide, it was the appearance of Tom Holland's Spider-Man in Disney and Marvel's Captain America Civil War that inspired a huge reaction from fans around the world. Chairman of Sony Pictures Entertainment Tom Rothman is well aware of the popularity of Marvel's take on the character, which is why the studio plans to expand Spider-Man's movieverse and keep communication open with Marvel. Speaking with THR about Sony Slate, Rothman made a point to mention plans for Spider-Man going forward. When asked about plans for a whole Spider-Man universe and working with Marvel on it as well, Rothman replied yes to both scenarios, saying Sony's relationship with Marvel is fantastic and that they are in fact going to keep working alongside Marvel on future movies set inside the Spideyverse. The first of these entries, Spider-Man Homecoming, is shooting now and will be released on July 7th, 2017. Dennis, what do you think about Rothman's comments about Marvel and Sony working together on a shared universe for Spider-Man? Uh, I mean, the comments, they're to be expected. There's, he's not going to say anything too controversial. He wants to play nice with Marvel. He wants to make it seem like, okay, we're, we're partners with Marvel and everything's A-OK. -okay. And for now it is. Uh, <laughs> I think what it really means is, look, we're swallowing our pride because we want to make money. And as long as we're making money and everything is good on that end, then every, the relationship with Marvel is good. But as soon as there's any type of misstep either creatively or financially you know there's going to be uh, a lot more infighting between the two companies right now sony's just like look here just do it 
give us the money. Mark, what do you think? I think that this is the exact right thing for anybody involved with Sony's side of things to say because you do not want to upset Marvel. In no scenario did Marvel just say, oh yeah, we'll throw Spider-Man in Civil War and everybody's going to love him. Then you guys go off and do your own thing. Marvel is going to be very involved in the future of Spider-Man, both in the standalone Sony movies and when Spider-Man contributes to huge Marvel pictures. You need Marvel's input. You need to have them on your good side because Marvel does creatively... they. Their decision making is so spot on in most cases, whereas Sony's has been a little lackluster in the last few years. So you want to make sure you have them on your team. And as soon as any friction happens, Dennis, my bet is that Marvel comes in and says, no, this is how we go moving forward. Marvel is still steering this ship, whether Sony wants to admit it or not. Yeah, Roka. Yeah, it seems to me that just a face-saving move by Rothman. It makes sense. You're the, you know, you you've got a little bit of a negative reputation about this with this character. So you hand it over to Marvel because you knew you needed to redeem this character. You let Marvel do it, but you want to say, hey, hey, we're involved too. We're involved too. As kind of a face-saving thing, so that people you might get a little more goodwill when you break off and do Sinister Six on your own, or possibly do the Venom Carnage uh, the movies that they've been rumored to be talking uh, doing, and all that kind of just. So when you have the Marvel, it's like Marvel spreads its like glitter on top of it, and. <laughs> You're like okay for now, and then like if it, and then I think if it does fall apart, Dennis, it, both things could happen. I think you're right. Uh, what you were saying, they could just start saying like, oh no, no, this or that. But I think Sony might say, well, look, we didn't. Uh, that wasn't our part of the thing. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So they can try to save face. They'll, that's when they'll start slamming heads. But I think if Marvel fails with it, they'll fail admirably in a way that Sony didn't. And I think they won't make the missteps that Sony did. And we've seen them do with the X Men movies at times too. Isn't that part of correlation with with Fox? Isn't Sony with Fox when the X-Men movies do or no? No, no. Okay, okay. Well, we've seen other properties that are Marvel properties not do well in different studios consistently uh, like they do under Marvel Studios. So I, I mean, it'd be really interesting to see if Spider-Man Homecoming isn't good, which I want it to be great. Yeah. But if it and then who gets the blame if Marvel steps up and says, hey, look, we worked together. We just didn't. It just didn't work out the way we wanted it to. Or if one team is like, eh, they, it was the, the, all yeah. the decisions you didn't like in this movie, that was them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for... If Homecoming doesn't do well, I think Marvel will get blamed just because I, I have a feeling they're just doing almost anything. Yeah. Sony's just slapping their name on it, maybe mm -hmm. throwing some money in there, but they're not really trying to control what's happening creatively. And that's, I think, what I get from these comments. And that's why I'm saying if there is some sort of misstep with that movie or any other future movie, then Sony will start. They, ha they have the ultimate say, but it's one of those things where it's like, We'll let you do what you do because you do it so well and you make a lot of money. I mean, also, like, look at look at the reception of Spider-Man for Civil War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a character that most people were like, oh, I'm sick of seeing these reboots. I'm tired of seeing Spider-Man. And look what happened when he was in Civil War. Everyone's going crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, Spider-Man, he was the best thing about Civil War. So I think that alone got got Marvel a lot more leeway. Yeah, there's no way they even named the movie Spider-Man Homecoming without getting Marvel's approval of it. I don't love the name, but I, I, I'm sure Marvel was like, yeah, we're cool with it. Make the movie. Yeah. All right. All right, what's next? Thanks to a supersized Star Wars issue from Entertainment Weekly, Row One, A Star Wars Story, has taken the spotlight to not only reveal that Darth Vader will be in the Star Wars story, but to also reveal some specifics about the band of rebel, rebels that will be a thorn in the side of the dreaded Galactic Empire. Yesterday, EW released a new set of images from the issue to get the fans excited, offering more than a few exclusive looks at all the characters appearing in the movie. But the most interesting part about the EW article are not the images, but rather the comments made by director Gareth Edwards and producer Kathleen Kennedy about the reshoots the movie is going through now. Naturally, both are downplaying the severity of the reshoots that the media has been endlessly reporting on. Speaking about it all, Edwards said, I mean, it was always part of the plan to do reshoots. We always knew we were coming back somewhere to do stuff. We just didn't know what it would be until we started sculpting the film in the edit. All little things within the pre-existing footage and that getting the large ensemble cast back together has been the biggest hurdle. Obviously, you've got to work around everyone's schedule and everyone's on different films all over the world. And so it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. That's why I think it's been blown out of proportion a little bit. Kathleen Kennedy backed up Edward's comments saying, there's nothing about the story that's changing with a few things that we're picking up in additional photography. I think that's the most important thing to reassure fans that it's the movie we intended to make. Fans everywhere will get their own chance to see whether or not it meant it means trouble for the production when Rogue One, a Star Wars story hits theaters on December 16th. 
Mark, what do you think of the latest images and of Gareth Edwards' comments about the reshoots? Well, I love the images. I think they look awesome. I love everything about the images and all of the footage that I've seen from Rogue One looks stellar. I like the Beach Boys Stormtroopers. I like the Death Troopers look. I like all of these things, all these new characters that we've been introduced to. I think Forrest Whitaker seems like a really interesting dude that's going to be working within the Rebellion. I love the way that Jared and his right-hand man have a different take on how to go about, you know, combating the evil empire. I like that Ben Mendelsohn is somebody who is going to be working under Darth Vader and has to report to both him and the Emperor. All of this stuff is great. The quotes from Gareth Edwards and Kathleen Kennedy, it's what I would expect to hear a director and a producer say when you're doing reshoots. It makes a lot of sense to me. I was never that panicked about the reshoots. I understand that maybe they're a little more extensive than what these comments would let on, but I don't mm -hmm. care if we need to, if it's a logistical nightmare to get all the cast back together. I don't care what you're reshooting. I really don't. I've said this all along. As long as the movie's good, when it comes out in December, I don't care how many reshoots you had to do. Yeah. Just get it right when we all go see the movie. For me, uh, I really like these pictures as well. My favorite one is those Death Troopers uh, yeah. like on the beach. But the one that stood out the most, though, was the Death Trooper holding that little kind of Stormtrooper doll mm -hmm. or figure, kind of showing that, you know, maybe in some parts of the galaxy, there's people who look up and admire the mm -hmm. Empire. Yeah. Thought that was nice. In terms of the comments, though, I differ a little from you. Yes, there are reshoots. Everyone knows these big budget movies have reshoots. Lord of the Rings, uh, every after every uh, movie they did, they had like, I think, six weeks of reshoots. They planned them. After every, every movie, they had them. Okay, that wasn't a big deal. No one was upset. I think from this comment, though, Edward says, when he says a logistical nightmare, that lends me to believe that there's more to the reshoots than a normal thing. Because when you sign up as an actor in your contract, you know you're going to have the reshoots. You have them scheduled in already. Mm -hmm. So why is it such a logistical nightmare if, if it is just the standard reshoot? So there must be more to it. That doesn't mean the movie's going to suck or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It just means that there's something more going on than the normal thing that they had scheduled. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Dennis. I think so, too. That stood out to me as well, like a, that you wouldn't have to have a logistical nightmare if you'd already planned it out. Yeah. And if you have but the fact that you have it means that there's these shoot reshoots are a little more extensive, extensive, extensive than they anticipated. Right. So they've got to go and get them all out. And they're, they're saying they're all working on different movies already. So certainly it wasn't planned out. The thing that also sticks out for me is what they're talking about with the story. They're saying the story's not going to change. This is a whole thing that uh, uh, that uh, Kathleen Kennedy said. But the thing is, we don't know what the story is. Right. We only know the general outline so they can say anything they want at this point when the movie comes out that is supposedly the original story but it only it only start coming out like in little bits and pieces as we get closer or maybe even after the movie comes out of what the original story was supposed to be remember the hand floating through the air with the lightsaber Luke's hand all that that was supposedly in the original script for Force Awakens so those kinds of things that it just seems to it, it does this, these comments I get what they're doing once again we're running that theme of saving face on the show today but it's a little bit uh, it does leave you a little unsettled but the images fantastic so excited the doll thing is a great thing to bring, bring up Dennis because it definitely refers back to what uh, Ray had the, the Jedi doll mm -hmm. that she had or the I'm sorry the X-Wing fighter doll that she had in Force Awakens so you get li these little images that they're trying to, to link back all around you know to to to, to the uh, to episode 7 my concern a little bit here is this beach tropical paradise that they're putting them in. I, they're trying to do images of like the South Pacific theater in World War II, and I'm wondering how that's really going to make people feel as they're watching it in the theater. It just, for it's me, gonna it look awesome, man. There's palm yeah. trees, there's AT-ATs. Okay. They, they can go on sand, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> not just snow. <laughs> they can rock some beaches, too. Right. I love the point about the dog. I didn't notice he was actually holding a Stormtrooper yeah. dog. Yeah. By the way, he took it out of the case, which is a moronic yeah. move. It <laughs> way, lost way all the values gone. The value <laughs> but look, I, I think I do agree with you guys largely is that there was more to the reshoots than what they're letting on. Mm. It just doesn't it, it doesn't put me in a state it doesn't of concern you. panic. I mean, I was nervous initially. Well, maybe the most nervous is when I read that they pulled the Rogue One comic 
that they were scheduling to release. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. that's like, wait, so they're changing the story here a little bit. But again, it's nothing that's going to keep me up at night because as long as you can fix these problems, same thing with any big production like Suicide Squad. I don't care if they're doing reshoots. As long as the movie's good in August and as long as Rogue One is good this Christmas, I'm cool. Do whatever you want. Yeah, and I'm super excited to see Saw Gerrera, which is the character Forrest Whitaker is playing. Mm -hmm. He he fought alongside Anakin in the Clone Wars. So if we're going to have, which it was released that Darth Vader's going to be in Rogue One now officially, I wonder if they're going to have a confrontation. I wonder what that's going to be about. I mean, we love the Ahsoka Tano, Ahsoka Tano confrontation in Clone Wars at the end of the season, second season. I mean Rebels. With, Re I'm sorry, Rebels, yeah, at the end of the second season with, with Anakin and with Slash Darth Vader. So I want to see if there's something of that in the film as well with Forrest Whitaker's character. There's so much history involved between them. All right. All right, guys. Now on to buy or sell. Shanine, what do we get up first? Sony Pictures has released a new trailer for Inferno, the follow-up to, follow to Angels and Demons and The Da Vinci Code, directed by Ron Howard and starring Tom Hanks. In the latest Robert Langdon adventure, the professor played by Hanks is on the run to uncover a mystery and stop a virus from being unleashed on the world's population. Naturally, the clues to stopping this are hidden in works of ancient literature, specifically Dante's Inferno. The film opens on October 28th and also stars Felicity Jones, Irfan Khan, Omar Sy, and Ben Foster. John, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Inferno? <laughs> <laughs> Inferno. I have to I have to sell it. I it just looks Oh, this does not look good, and I'm shocked that there's a third one in this series. Who has gone to see the first two <laughs> with such with such yeah. fandom and fervor? I don't know, and this is not a criticism to Ron Howard. I love him as a filmmaker. Obviously, love Tom Hanks. It's a good cast. Ben Foster, uh, Khan. He, these are all good actors, but. The trailer looks terrible. It looks overdubbed. It's like one of these bad European movies that's overdubbed, and you're like, ooh. And then they give away everything. Like, he supposedly loses his mind or gets controlled, mind-possessed, and then you know what? He's okay. We fixed it out. And it's like, well, why are you going to show that in the trailer? Like, it just seems to me like, I don't know what they're trying to do, but the trailer seems to be a mishmash and doesn't make you excited for the film at all. I love the idea of Dante's Inferno. That's an awesome book, and the fact that they're going to explore that, that's a great place to go. There's so much to explore there. But to me, it seemed like they gave away most of the movie in the trailer, which I really hate seeing. Mark? Yeah, I'm going to sell it. I hate when professors lose their mullet and they grow up. You know, that really <laughs> blows. I like Tom Hanks' old school haircut. And so now we got the new one. I like the previous trailer for this. However, mm. this one I'm selling because just as the trailer, you're right. It just felt it felt slopped together. The editing was all over the place. I didn't like how it came off. It didn't sell me on the movie. Though the best thing about this trailer is what I liked from the previous one is they set you up with that premise. That sounds pretty scary. Yeah. It's like, okay, so we can either kill half the population right now or in 100 years everybody dies it's like wow that's a that's a brain teaser right there you know that's a that's a hard thing to rectify so i already <laughs> liked that from the previous trailer and now you just showed me a bunch of other stuff i don't really care about i'm still excited to see the movie on that day when i wake up i'm gonna be like oh cool i get to see the hell movie tonight i'm looking forward to that i like tom hanks i love ron howard mm. it's gonna be fun to get excited for that day but before that i don't really care it's a big sell for me. I, I thought the trailer was terrible. I mean, I uh, you know Ron Howard's great, Tom Hanks is great, the cast. Just I didn't I didn't like the first one. Uh, it was a Da Vinci Code. And yeah. I found that there was no chemistry between uh, Tom Hanks and uh, Audrey Tattoo. Yeah. I, I, the the story there was no suspense for something that was supposed to be like a thriller mystery. I just I, it, it kind of bored me. Didn't watch the second one, and then this one it was just so terribly done. It, honestly, if it wasn't for Tom Hanks and Ron Howard, you would think this is like a a straight to DVD movie or something like they had like the cheesy titles only he can unlock the mystery only he can stop the unthinkable like who put this trailer together <laughs> this is an awful awful trailer Sinead what do you think I think the trailer sucks. <laughs> whoa, whoa. I never saw the first trailer I thought this was the first trailer um, but I literally out loud as soon as it was done went what like that was it I have no other feelings for it. Mm. Don't, I mean, don't look, like it. Here's the thing is that if I got to either kill half the population today <laughs> or you get to wait 100 years, like 100 years, like I'm not going to be around 100 <laughs> yeah. years. This so is really right. getting Yeah, no, you're, you're on so this thing, man. No, so basically, easy. you're like, hey, I, I'm going to be selfish. <laughs> yeah. F, F the human race. I'll be alive. Yeah, it doesn't affect me. 100 uh, years from now, the sun's probably going to burn out anyway. I'm good to go. You're, it, we're good now. 100 years from now, not so lucky. Sorry, that's the choice I made. <laughs> don't, don't you feel there are these kinds of movies that just don't quite get there, and they keep trying to get there, and they don't quite get there, and you just can't understand with all this talent involved <laughs> why that keeps happening consistently? Angels and Demons was the same thing mm -hmm. as the first one. You're just like, oh, why isn't... 
Why don't? Oh, okay. And didn't it make so significantly less? Yeah. Than, than the That's first That's why one. I don't understand. There's a third. I think one, it right? had a big opening weekend, not as big as Da Vinci Codes, but it had a big opening weekend. And I imagine this one is going to have somewhat of an opening weekend, but not even as big as Angels and Demons. If I had told everybody that, hey, between this series, it's just beloved novels that everybody loved reading. These three movies versus the two National Treasure movies, which ones are going to be better? We, I, we, you'd be crazy if you picked National Treasure. Right. Those movies are fun rides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These, it's a lot of work. Yeah. All right, what's next? The first trailer has been released to Mechanic Resurrection, a follow-up to the 2011 action film Mechanic that sees the return of Jason Statham's bishop who is forced to return to the life he left behind in order to complete an impossible list of assassinations of the most dangerous men in the world. The film also stars Jessica Alba, Michelle Yao, and Tommy Lee Jones. Mechanic Resurrection opens August 26th. Dennis, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Mechanic Resurrection? I'm going to sell this. I mean, the opening sequence was kind of cool. Reminded me of Mission Impossible, mm. like something that Tom Cruise would do. Yeah. But I, I'm selling it for two reasons. Because I actually like the, the first mechanic. But the two re- main reasons I liked it are now gone. One, you have Ben Foster, mm-hmm. gone. He's, he's not coming back in this one. And two, Simon West, who directed the first one, is not directing this one. Simon mm. West, I think, is a very good action director he did the second expendables which i think is the best expendables movie he did con air and i thought he did a good job with the mechanic uh the the new director i can't remember his name but i looked i tried to look at his work and it was nothing i'd seen before so i'm just not that excited about it roca yeah same thing i sell it as well this is one of those things that dennis is a great point you bring up the director you you just find stuff you it's not that good or you haven't seen before it's kind of middling this is one of those jason statham middling vehicles i i really loved the first mechanic i actually thought it was a good remake of the charles yeah. bronson original charles and i went to college together that's how old we are but like i, th- I really enjoyed <laughs> how old the- are you roca <laughs> Thank God. I am a vampire. And so I, I, I really enjoyed this take, the first take in 2011 because you had Ben Foster. It was great, great juxtaposition, which was, which, which was the Jan Michael Vincent part in the original. So that was great. But this seems like really like one of these uh, cash grab remake films. You put Jessica Alba in it, which I don't understand at all why she keeps getting these parts. Uh, Tommy, really? You don't understand? <laughs> no. Why Jessica Alba is there are plenty of beautiful women that can actually act. And I think she's she's a surface level actress. There's no, again, not going to get much from her other than that and she's the reason Sin City 2 didn't work for me as well it just doesn't just for whatever reason it's, I have issues with what she does in the work but like uh, yeah, she, I, you're not going to be on her Christmas list well, no <laughs> well, she probably hates me she doesn't, whatever but Tommy Lee Jones Jessica Alba is literally watching this at home and she just cross broke off <laughs> yeah, the Christmas list like Steve Buscemi and what was that uh, was that Adam <laughs> Sandler Billy Madison, Billy yeah. Madison. Uh, no no but, uh, but uh, Tommy Lee Jones being in it kind of perked me up and I was like oh maybe maybe he has a way of elevating films when he's in them and so I may go see the film but this trailer itself looks so bad oh I'll tell you this I'm buying the trailer but if you're if you're if you think that there's some level of optimism because Tommy Lee Jones in this movie <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones I think he lost the bet with somebody where it's like oh dude you lost the bet so now you got to be in every action movie that gets offered <laughs> to you for five years. he is in every Tommy Lee Jones will show up in every action movie playing the exact same role as he's just the guy wait, wait go watch the Bourne trailer that's who he plays plays in every movie. I love Tommy Lee Jones. He is a fantastic actor. He just shows up on movie sets uninvited and he just walks in front of the camera and is like, oh, we got to get the, what's his name? The mechanic. We got to get the mechanic. Like the reason why I buy this trailer is because it looks like a stupid, fun 90s action movie. That's what I want to see. It opens August 26th for a reason. The summer's winding down. You want to get that one last punch in there. Is this movie going to be good? No, but I am gonna buy it. I'm gonna buy it with like PayPal money. You know how like you know how you have money in your PayPal account and you're like, oh, I, I forgot that money was even there. Mm. I'm gonna buy that with the twenty dollar bill you found in your pants right before you did laundry. Hey, what do you think of the name too? Uh, Resurrection. I mean, yeah. we already had this Independence Day resurgent. We had Transporter refueled. It's a terrible title. Yeah. It's better than Resurgence, Dennis. It's a lot better than Resurgence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's supposedly about him going back into the life, right? Resurrected back into the life, which is ugh, which yeah. is just not... Well, just, we've yeah. seen that a million times. Yes, we have. He does do the Jesus thing a lot in this trailer. Like, he just, like, spreads his... Way, just like, ah! You know, I think Jason Satham might think he's an actual bird in this yeah. movie. He does a lot of jumping from high places. I hope he's okay. Plus, the, the good thing about the first one was that Jason Statham wasn't a typical killer. Like, mm-hmm. he was a guy that had 
a conscience. He was doing things for a reason. He didn't unnecessarily kill people. It was a much more dramatic movie than yes. I thought it would be. Yes. It was a little lighter on the action mm -hmm. than I thought going in, but yeah, it had some nice story to it. Exactly. And when you see this, it just looks like I'm just going to kill everybody, guards, henchmen, whoever. And it yeah. just seems like, well. All right, what's next? Many of the new images that have been released thus far for Michael Bay's fifth entry into the Transformers franchise, The Last Night, have been small glimpses of the new vehicle forms for the Autobot Bumblebee and the Decepticon Barricade. But that has now changed thanks to an Instagram post from director Michael Bay himself, who revealed the newest Transformer, a blue Vespa scooter by the name of Squeaks. In addition to the reveal of the new Transformers character, a couple interesting new logos for the forthcoming sixth and seventh installments of the Transformers franchise franchise were also revealed, with one logo seemingly confirming that it will be a film focusing on Bumblebee. The image comes from Transformers World 2005, where Hasbro laid out their future plans for the movies during the Jeffrey's 2016 Consumer Conference. Transformers The Last Night comes to theaters on June 23rd, 2017. Mark, do you buy or sell the new Transformers character, Squeak? Oh, well, why wouldn't I, Sinead? I mean, this is what I've been waiting for in Transformers. <laughs> I, I, th I sat through four of those epic turd cuts just so I could Wait, I'm just waiting for a scooter to turn into a. That's what I'm waiting. Uh, yeah, it's nice to have a big truck turn into a robot. Sure, it's awesome to see a, a Corvette transform it. I'm waiting for a Vespa. That's what's going to turn the tide of Transformers. Yeah. This is the sell for me. I don't hate the way the character looks. He looks fine, but he's in the Transformers world. And now that you're there, you got to do so much to get me to buy anything involved with this universe. And sorry, Squeaks, I love you to death. You're going to sell a lot of stupid toys. I do not buy you. Yeah. Roga. Yeah, I absolutely sell that as well. I mean, for everything Mark just said, it's a Vespa. A Vespa. Like, who was clamoring for a Vespa? But I think this is Michael Bay and the studio's way of saying, hey, old people, screw you. We're going for the younger. younger. I mean, they cast the girl from Nickelodeon, I think, and the, the Vespa appeals for the younger generation, that kind of thing, and maybe Europeans, the Italians. Really? Child. Are there kids that grow up Child. wanting to ride a Vespa one day? Yes, Mark. Are there really? Yes. I think they want to drive a car. Well, I think that's the, Vespa the goal. Works too. The Vespa's yeah. kind of a rich kind of feeling to it yeah you yeah. see it in italy all the time ciao i'm gonna see i want to see a golf cart turn into a that's what i want to see yeah <laughs> i just want to see a golf cart mm. <laughs> that's old transformer <laughs> anyway but but i actually gonna half buy half sell because i like the images of what's of the universe the cinematic universe that's coming that looks awesome and i'm a stupid sucker for that crap wait, wait, but you're I, talking about this one over here yes this that looks, looks awesome. terrible no i that love it Effing terrible. Oh my God. You, looks like some stickers for like little kids. Why are you yelling at me on your birthday? <laughs> That's the best 40th at birthday voice oh I've ever heard out of Dennis. Oh it's fantastic. God. But the squeaks thing, Fancy. I just, I really, I can't. It just seems, I don't think it's made for me, so I can't buy it. Okay, well, I mean, it's a huge sell for me. Yes, the squeaks himself, he's cute. He sure. looks like Wally. Mm. If they made yes. a movie and they had this character and it was a kid's movie, fine. He does not belong in Transformers. Nope. This is Michael Bay's. F you to the fans. This is this is like um, when George Lucas heard about Jar Jar, and then in the Clone Wars, he's like, oh, they don't like Jar Jar. Here's an episode all Jar Jar. They don't like Jar Jar. Here, here we go. And this is Michael Bay's version of that. He's like, look, I can do whatever I want. This movie, this this franchise, this movie makes tons of money and takes makes massive money overseas. I can do what I want. This is gonna sell more toys. It's gonna put more money in my pocket. Let's do it. He doesn't care. Yeah, I mean, this robot looks like the kid that Wally and Eve had before <laughs> Eve just left Wally. Wally had to raise this kid by himself because you know Eve. As soon as that movie's over, they did it once, then Eve goes off to France with some rich guy. So Wally had to raise this poor bastard yeah. all by himself, and you see what the results are. He can barely talk. Yeah. Isn't, isn't this his version of IG-88? This is like his version of IG-88. No, no, no. Riley made a good point. Riley said before in pre-production that yeah. it, it's the, their BB-8. They're like, oh, BB-8 was really cute. Oh, BB-8, I'm sorry. Force Awakens. So now they, they have their BB-8, yeah. which, I which I, I'm going to put money on is not going to be cute. He's going to be annoying. He's going to yeah. be effing annoying in the, in the movie. I don't know that he's going to be the most annoying thing about the movie because it is a Transformers <laughs> film. But uh, yeah, I'm not walking. I'm not paying to see this movie because of Squeaks. I just wonder what racist squeaks. voice they're going to use like they did with those two little guys in the second film. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what they use for Squeaks. Sh Sinead, what do you think about Squeaks, the Transformer? Um, I mean, it, he looks cute maybe, but... I absolutely hate Vespas. No offense to anyone who rides a Vespa. Ciao. You, just, you just took out half the half your European <laughs> yeah, All the Italians hate I'm you really now. I'm really sorry, and I'm and I haven't been to Europe, so I don't know like 
I know a lot of people ride Vespas in Europe, but I mean like here in LA, when I first moved to LA, I used to get so annoyed by the Vespas on the road. Vespas annoy the crap out of me. And nothing about a Vespa says Transformers to me mm. at all. It's very, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I do think he's cute, but yeah, he's going to squeak a lot. And I think he will be annoying. Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. What's next? The first full trailer to 2014's box office hit, Ouija, has been released. The sequel entitled Ouija, Origin of Evil, is written and directed by Mike Flanagan in a story set in 1965 that will explore the source of scares that come from a Ouija board. The movie stars Elizabeth Reeser, Henry Thomas, and Doug Jones. Ouija, Origin of Evil, hits theaters this October 21st. John, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Ouija, Origin of Evil? I hate to do this again. I have to sell this, too. This trailer looked bad. I just did not enjoy it at all and the CGI effects of her demonic possession were not in any way scary it was comical more than anything else I think one of our fans on the Collider news article for this trailer stated I kept waiting for Frank Drebin from Na uh, from uh, Naked Gun to show up <laughs> and I think that's the perfect analysis of this trailer it just felt very comical not horror-esque at all and uh, I, I dug the 60s vibe to it I think it's always fun to put a little horror in different time frames but, uh, but it just seemed to me really, really comical. And the whole, we've seen it before. It's had an exorcist vibe to it with that priest coming in, saying your daughter's possessed and all this kind of jazz. And then her mouth shutting and all that. And the kid hitting himself. That's an omen reference. So all of that, it just seemed very like we'd seen it before a, m a million other times. Nothing about this was horror or interesting or original. Yeah. I'm going to buy it. I'm not the biggest horror fan. Everyone knows that. Yet I'm somehow the champion of the horror <laughs> here at Collider. Um... <laughs> Just for me, yeah, I, I like the a little different vibe. I like the premise of it, the scam artist now being oh, yeah. faced with the actual true supernatural nature of this. Uh, I like the, the slingshot sequence. So I, I don't know if I, I didn't see the first one. I don't know if I'm going to see the second one. Mm. But as just a trailer, I, I thought it was above average. What about you, Mark? I'm going to have to sell it, Dennis. Yeah. I'm a guy that liked the first Ouija. Yes, I'm the one. I thought it was a nice, <laughs> fun, scary movie. This one, I was looking forward to, like you said, takes place in the 60s. Yeah. Oh, we get an origin story for the Ouija board. But it just ends up being some kid running around just doing little card tricks and just, just like, oh, I'm going to mess with your mind. I'm going to use a little bit of my force powers. I'd be more afraid of Junior from Problem Child than I would this. <laughs> I don't understand what the problem is. Just Get the kid. I hate. I hate when horror movies just rely on kids being creepy. Mm. That's an element of your movie. That's fine. But that's what this entire trailer was predicated yeah. upon. Was we have a Ouija board and then oh look out, we got an eight year old with an attitude. That's a come on, man. <laughs> I wanted to like. I would have bought this. I literally walked into the Ouija store like, hey, do you guys have any trailers for sale? And they showed me this, and I'm like, ah, you know what? I think I'm good. I gotta go. <laughs> Ever since Ellis has been on Collider Nightmares, he's just his standard for horror movies have, has gone up. Maybe it has been elevated. Yeah. I will tell you, though, the reason why Roca wanted to see Lieutenant Frank Drebin in this trailer <laughs> is because of the Hermit's Hermit song that they had <laughs> playing, which you will see in the first Naked Gun movie. It's a great tune. They totally ruined it, it in this trailer. It mm. could have been really creepy. There's a way to make Hermit's Hermit's creepy. They just didn't succeed. You know, Peter Noon pitched me that when we were in middle school together. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a good song. I'm into some Something good. That was a uh, great song. He knows members of Hermits, Hermits, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. All right. Before we get on to box office <laughs> predictions, I want to check in with uh, Wendy Lee. What is the chat room saying about all our main topics and buy or sells? All right. Well, uh, for the Spider-Man sure shared universe with Marvel, most of the chat is into this, though some are saying that Sony is doing this just because they want a piece of that Marvel cake. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Ortiz says, let's see Homecoming before we talk about the whole universe. And for the Rogue Run reshoots and images, they're liking the new, new images. Or A says, I love, love, love the shots of the Stormtroopers in the ocean and the Death Trooper holding the Stormtrooper doll really adds war in uh, Star Wars. For the new trailer, Infernal, as a whole, they're pretty much selling the trailer, saying it looks terrible. Uh, a lot of them saying that the trailer told them too much, and why does anybody even want the sequel? Um, and for the Transformers, the new Squeak character, I can hear the chat room groaning about this, so it's a huge <laughs> sell. And KenDog909 says, Oh, nope, sorry, wrong person, sorry. Um, Michael Branch says, sell this now, oh geez. Here we go again with another pointless Transformer character that does not need, does not make any sense to be a Transformer movie. Please reboot this tra franchise in my lifetime. And finally, for the Ouija Origin of Evil trailer, they're selling this trailer as well. So I'm asking who asked to be, uh, to dig up the old Ouija franchise again? 
Keith Jones says, I have to sell this trailer, not only because it was lame, but also because I feel like they show me most of the movie in the trailer. Mm. All right, now we're on to our weekly Friday segment, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we try and guess the top five movies and how much they're going to make this weekend. Uh, Mark, what do, what do you got? I am going to, after seeing the movie last night, <laughs> I'm definitely not putting Independence Day Resurgence at the one slot. I'm going to stay with Finding Dory for the second week in a row. I'm going to put Independence Day Resurgence regretfully as high as number two. At number three, I'm going to have the shark movie, The Shallows. Mm. At number four, I'm going to go with Central Intelligence. And at number five, I'm going to wedge Free State of Jones in there just above The Conjuring 2. Yeah. Rocket? Uh, yeah, Finding Dory, definitely number one. Uh, I think it's going to definitely retain its audience. It's such a good film. And I was right about the prediction, 134 million. I said 131. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of experience. Yeah, that's right. Independence Day, Independence Day Resurrection, uh, I want that. I think that's going to be number two. Uh, but I think it's the box office is not going to be that high for it. Central Intelligence, I have at number three because... I keep hearing this weird kind of negative mixed buzz about the shallows, and I think that's going to push it down mm -hmm. to four. And uh, yeah, Free State of Jones at five. I think enough people are curious to see how the, what that film's all about. Okay, my, cl my list is similar to yours. I have Finding Door at number one, Independence Day Resur Resurgence at number two, Central Intelligence three, Shallows four, but I'll put, I'll put The Conjuring two up at number five. I think with the Free State of Jones, I just haven't seen much advertising mm. for it. I don't, there's no buzz about, people aren't talking about. I just have a feeling that, especially, it's coming out in the summer season. This is not a summer movie. People are not raring to go see this type of film right now. Not at all. I'm going with the counter-programming angle that it's just different. It's got Matthew McConaughey. He's a leading man. Mm. It's uh, I, I'm not sure, even sure how many theaters it's opening in versus mm -hmm. something like The Conjuring 2. Mm. I think it's going to be a very, very tight race. Plus, we've seen that there's, uh, you know, it's set in the time. It's talking about slavery. We've seen that the African-American market, when they when a, feel appeals to, a film appeals to them, will go in droves and, and on a Opening weekend, and so it's certainly possible that I think it'll it'll at least have a piece of that pie. Okay. All right, guys. Before we get into mailbag, I want to remind you we have a contest going on for Comic Con. We've been talking about it. You get two free tickets or badges, which are very hard to get. You can't even you can't even buy them. Uh, you get uh, airfare for two, hotel room, and some spending cash for Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con. You can find out all the details in our YouTube description. We have a link there. Also, uh, the contest ends June 30th, which is actually pretty soon, and it's for, I think, continental U.S. residents only. All right, let's move on to mailbag. Sinead, what do we got first? Andrew writes, hey, everyone, quick question. Why are TV shows much more highly rated on IMDb than movies? Are we more critical of movies, or is it something else? What are your thoughts? Uh, for me, it's simple. It's not that we're more critical on movies. It's that for television shows... By the time you get to the second, third, fourth, fifth season, the only people who are watching those shows are the fans. And so they're going to be a little more generous mm -hmm. in their ratings because they obviously still like it. Where a movie is a one-shot deal, it comes out, you either like it or you don't. So it, 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 it has that to it. So I think that's the main reason. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think TV shows have more opportunity to get it right because they have multiple seasons. So you can, and people can get reintroduced to them and see them and go whatever. And where and they take characters on interesting journeys that keep progressing and changing. We see that with Game of Thrones all the time. A character that's negative for a couple of seasons all of a sudden gets redeemed for a third and fourth season. And then by the fifth season, you're like super hyped to see what happens. But with movies, it's a confined space. It's two hours, three hours, whatever your hour and a half, whatever your movie is, and then it's done. And you can't, you don't really get to revisit it and change the character and do whatever. And most of the times when you do sequels, they kind of undercut what you've already created. So it adds a little bit more negativity going back. So I just think TV shows have more opportunity. Mark? I don't trust IMDb. <laughs> Not in the slightest. I, they're great for fact checking. Like it's the yeah. real stuff in there as far as who directed a movie, maybe some fun trivia about it, who stars in it. I don't trust the IMDb rankings at all because anybody can go on there and just click a yeah. button and then now they've influenced mm -hmm. it. So I just don't trust them, whether it's TV or it's movies. I stay away from IMDb ratings. Yeah, I, I've went on rants about that before just because it's it's way towards more of a fanboy culture. You'll see a ton of Chris Nolan movies in the top 50 movies of all time, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just not that Chris Nolan isn't great, but it's like, okay, you can see where, where the bias is coming in. All right, what's next? 
Shane writes, hey, Collider crew, greetings from County Roscommon, Ireland. Leash was a tough one yesterday. Hope this one's easier. <laughs> I watch your shows every day, and thanks to all you guys for the great content. My question concerns movies that aren't generally brought up when people talk about their favorites. We all know the great movies, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Godfather, Jaws, Dark Knight, the list goes on. For me, while I adore all these movies for different reasons, my favorite movie of all time is a little sports flick called Cool Runnings. I think it's a funny, heartfelt, wonderful underdog story with the mature undertone and I love it. Do you guys have any unconventional favorites that might not usually get talked about? Mark? Uh, I'm going to go with a few different categories here. Y'all know that I love the classic spoof movies. If you had never seen Hot Shots, it is <laughs> hysterical. It makes fun of Top Gun, and it is seriously one of the all-time great comedic performances in the history of anything by Mr. Lloyd Bridges. As far as a movie that always, I think, should get mentioned with the great sports films of all time that never gets up there with the Rockies and the Rudies is The Sandlot. Just a bunch of kids Aww. playing baseball one summer, and it's funny, it's heartwarming. In that vein, I'd also <laughs> throw City Slickers in there. City Slickers is a great movie for Absolutely. the entire family. There's a lot of laughs. There's a lot of cool stuff for the kids in there, too. And the last one I'll say is that it's a work of pure genius, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Ooh. Don't worry about Big Top Pee-wee. Go watch Pee-wee's Big Adventure. It's directed by Tim Burton, one of his first feature films, starring the incredible Paul Rubens, such a great, gifted, comedic actor as Pee-wee. It is so funny and weird and quirky. You're never going to see another movie like that again. Ever. Okay. Sometimes, you, someday you're gonna have to explain the Sandlot thing to me. I don't get it. All right. Uh, I would say out of. Si <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? It's baseball. You understand baseball? Yeah, I understand baseball. He, he was around when they invented baseball. Yeah, don't, I mean, you, yeah, don't you remember? I feel like that movie was a denigration to what the great forefathers of baseball invented. Yeah. Yeah. Look, just because Babe Ruth beat you out to play on the Yankees <laughs> way back son in of the twenties, that I mean, son of a yeah. Don't get me started on that chain smoking son of a. <laughs> All right, um, I would say out of sight. People talk about this is this to me is one of Soderbergh's best films, and and it, it didn't do great box office. And people quietly talk about how much love they have for the film. It's the best Jennifer Lopez performance ever, and Clooney is never more charming and dashing as he is in this film. And Don Cheadle is a pretty good villain. Uh, I, I think uh, Payback is what the Bill Gibson's Payback. I'll walk that line of trying not to offend anybody, but Payback is a fantastic film. I absolutely love the grittiness of that film. Film. And Mel Gibson is super awesome in that film. James Coburn, Chris Christopherson, Deborah Carl Unger, James, a bunch of people involved in this film is really powerful. Eternal Sunshine, Spotless Mind, we've already talked. And a couple of foreign ones for Gerard Depardieu. I love his version of Cyrano de Bergerac. Not a lot of people talk about this as one of the top foreign films. And he did another film with his son called All the Mornings of the World, which is an exploration of a generational family and, vi and violence. Yes, I know. You're probably bored by now. But... These are one of the greatest, amazing films that I really enjoyed the hell out of, and nobody seems to talk about. And my last one, I think, is La Bamba. La Bamba, I'm saying that correctly, not like JT. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the best <laughs> musical biopics you'll ever see. Lou Diamond Phillips is absolutely fantastic in the film. Isai Morales, very powerful film. And if you're, you know, if you can actually understand this situation, understand the brother stuff, the family stuff, the desire to be successful and the price he has to pay ultimately for his success. It's a very powerfully moving film and the ending is heartbreaking and even more devastating after what happens to him when you see in the movie. So those are, these are the films that like I quietly love and see anytime they're on TV. It's a great list and I'm sure that if the Sandlot was called Un Lat de San that you would love. <laughs> yeah. First of all, none of that was Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> none of that was I was Spanish. going French. I was that going was French. French. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you're yeah, saying. I could do French all day long. <laughs> Spanish. Uh, for me, a movie that I think people like but don't love it as much as me is John Hillcoat's Lawless that came out a few years ago. Oh, I, yeah. I thought, oh yeah. I thought it was like a perfect blend of the western and the gangster film. Yeah. He had very great performances from Tom Hardy, Jessica Chastain, Jason Clark, uh, LaBeouf. Guy, yeah, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. Uh, Guy Pierce was yeah. a really creepy villain. Yeah, even had a little cameo by Gary Oldman. Oh, yeah. Really liked that film. Cold Mountain is a movie that is one of my favorites that don't really, people don't talk about a lot. It's a epic Civil War movie, but at the heart of it, it's a, it's a romance film mm -hmm. between uh, uh, Nicole Kidman and Jude Law. And it's uh, Anthony Minghella, who also directed, uh, I think, The English Patient as oh. well. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Especially. Sinead, is there any movies that are kind of your unconventional uncon favorites? Oh, well, I don't know how unconventional these are, but I'm like a sucker for um, late 90s, early 2000s rom-coms. So um, I love She's All That, 
Freddie Prince Jr. and uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, Heath Ledger, Julia Stiles. And Wendy and I were talking about this before, and we were we were saying we would have said forgetting Sarah Marshall, but we feel like that's more because it's become it's so good. It's become like a pop culture staple yeah. re- more recently than when it first came out, but mm-hmm. it gets quoted all the time. But I will say. Um, we don't talk as much about Adam Sandler anymore after his like golden age, but I do love 50 First Dates a lot. I feel like it was like one of his last worthy movies before it all went really sour, <laughs> but I like 50 First Dates. I feel like it's such an easy movie to watch and it still makes me laugh. Yeah, I would throw Big Daddy and the Wedding Singer in there too. Those are yeah. great Adam Sandler movies. Punch Drunk Love as well. Mm-hmm. If for him veering off, that's one that people don't talk about enough. It's so great. All right. All right, guys, before we get into t- live Twitter questions, I want to remind you that we have the Schmodown today at 2 p.m. We have Jeff Schneider versus Sam Levine. Wow. Uh, and that's going to be a very interesting battle because they both really know, they have deep knowledge in, in movie trivia. Oh, these guys both can play ball. I mean, Sam Levine is somewhat of a savant when it comes to movie trivia, but do not undersell Jeff Snyder. Yes, he loves being a heel. He loves mm-hmm. talking a big game, but he can back it up. I have Levine winning this thing, mm-hmm. but I think it's going to be closer than a lot of people expect. Jeff Snyder is going to bring his A game. And who's the, are they going to face, the winner's going to face who? Uh, the this? winner is potentially going to face Clark Wolf, okay. I believe. Ooh, wow. I'm not sure about that yet. We got to cook some matches uh-huh. up. but uh, And then that person would be probably the number one contender after that. Uh, yeah, then you go up against the magical belt that is still held by Mr. Mark Riley. Don't forget about next week either because I'm going up against that shaved Ewok known as JTE. Yeah. And I cannot wait to take him down yet another peg in the movie trivia schmodown. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Just talking about everyone else but me. That's great. <laughs> that broadcast school is really paying off. I'm coming for everyone. Uh, but yeah, this looks like it's going to be an awesome match. Uh, I, I love the uh, Sam Levine serial killer look that he has there. And, and Snyder, I mean, he looks like he just finished killing 30 people. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to a movie trivia contest now too. Uh, Snyder, love the heel aspect of Snyder. So brilliant. So well done. If you love wrestling, you love Snyder. You know how this works. Great stuff that he's doing there. Yeah. All right, let's get move on to live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video, and Shanane will pick out a few. What do we got? Hold on one second. I accidentally t- closed out my Twitter. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Stall. Stall. This sounds like an episode. Live. Live. I'm that, sorry. that episode, of, we had a mailbag episode, and it was in the bloopers, I think a week or two ago, <laughs> where we get everything started, do my intro, <laughs> toss to Sinead, my computer and, and her died. computer died. <laughs> Like, straight up. Like, the entire thing was like... It right. seems like maybe a lot of times when your computer dies, you're putting undue stress on it. Maybe by visiting websites that you shouldn't be sure. going to. I or, was closing out my show notes. Yeah, if only there was a little yeah. thing icon in the right-hand side that would tell you how close you were to the battery going dead on your yeah. on your computer. If only they had that. She calls them show notes. Yeah, I call them tax returns. We all know <laughs> what you're looking at. All, all right. right. All right. A. Clay tweets, Is it harder to critique a director or a script? I would say script because Mm. I don't see it. Like at least with the director, you can look at some of the choices and be like, "Oh, that was a that was a weird angle." Oh, like the shadows in the guy's face. Like you can see some technical aspects of a director's work that's either great or lacking. But with a script, it's really hard to tell how many cooks were in the kitchen, how closely the filmmakers stayed to the original script. Mm. So I think it's harder to critique that. I think you, you you can say a film gets saved even if there's some bad direction. If there's any good direction in the film, you could say, oh, I like that scene or I like that scene. It's really hard once a film starts out with bad dialogue to be saved by any good written dialogue scene. It's Most of the times, it's that's what you focus on. When the dialogue is bad, it's pretty much standard through the movie. With a director, at times, it can be saved. Certain moments can be saved because the director kind of hit some kind of uh, whatever streak and nailed it for that. And so I think it's, it's harder to critique the script and, than it is the director. Yeah, I'm going to go the opposite of Ellis. I think it's harder to critique the director just because you don't know certain things that are involved. Is it the actor giving a bad performance mm. or is it the director not pulling the performance that's needed with the script? The script, it, it's not there on the screen, but eventually, if you wanted to, you could take get a copy of the script and read it and yeah. see if those lines actually work. Uh, with the director, it's a lot harder. Just You don't know what the studio heads are telling them and... Just a lot of outside influence for him. Oh, hey, you guys want a movie where I can blame the director and the script? What? Independence Day <laughs> Resurgence. Oh. Blame everybody involved in that movie. It was terrible. <laughs> Flush it down the toilet and never talk about it again. Yeah. Well, I can't because now he's ingrained into my life history because right. that's yeah. how I rung in my 40s. <laughs> like, the, the forever 
I, I can't get rid of it. I think Elvis dying on the toilet at 40 was better than seeing independent <laughs> Oh, man. How dare you? Oh. Sir, how dare you? Oh. I'm, I, Sir. I know he was a good personal friend of yours. I don't want to. I'm sorry. When he was a, oh, gosh. When he was an up-and-comer. <laughs> were you his karate I was teacher? His, <laughs> I was his karate teacher. We were doing it. I, I gave him his first peanut Colonel butter Tom banana Roca. sandwich. <laughs> it's always nice when you turn 40 that you had someone like ancient like John Roke on the show with you. Totally. Yes. Totally. All right, what's next? <laughs> Aaron tweets, is WB slash DC doing fans a disservice by showing BBS uncut in only 12 theaters in the country for one night? I'm upset. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm not upset. It's because it's going to come out on Blu-ray. So yeah. if you want to see it, you, you have the opportunity to see it. They're just putting it in theaters. Something like this, they know not... The mass audience isn't going to come see this thing, so they're only going to put it in very select places. Yeah, but it would be cool to go see it on the big screen, you know, in that huge presentation. Because, like, you know, if you have a Blu-ray player, you have a nice TV, that's one thing. But seeing this in a theater is something else entirely. Myself, I don't think I have enough confidence to go see any other cut of that movie in a theater and, like, pay money to see it. But if we all get to watch the Blu-ray that hopefully is sent free, then I would love to check out the director's take. Yeah, I'm going to find a way to see it. Absolutely. I think I think the the, the commenter is right because uh, I think it should have been available in more than just 12 theaters because mm -hmm. the thing did make money. Maybe it didn't make the money that people thought it was going to make. It, people, I think, would still go. The hardcore fans, if they had released it across the country, would have gone for a one-night event to sell out that theater for one screening or or however screenings they're going to have in the theaters. I think they would have gone. I, I didn't think the movie was all that great, but I would still, I'm going to go just for curiosity's sake. You know. All right, what's next? Ariana tweets, can Jennifer Lopez ever give a performance in a film like she did with Out of Sight and Selena? Ooh, Very great good question. question. So let's go through her history since oh. Out of Sight. You got Made your in Made Manhattan. in Manhattan, a <laughs> uh, favorite of both of ours. Uh -huh. um, you got your, uh, what was the Wedding Planner? Yes. Wedding Planner. Her and uh, McConaughey? Ma yeah, before the McConaughey. Yeah. Yeah. I actually really like that movie, too. I yeah. saw that one. Well. <laughs> I think Jennifer Lopez is I, a good actress. I, I think she can be a good actress. Can be, there we and, go. And uh, what was the movie where she uh, beats the crap out of her abusive husband? Enough. That was pretty good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. You know, that was a good take. I saw, I saw that one. What was the one? The boy, the, the guy boy, next door. Boy, boy, boy next door, guy next door. I saw that. With the eye. I will never forget that, that scene was, as long as I live. That was I saw that, but that was entertaining in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. In the, okay, I'm here to watch a cheesy yeah. movie. But whatever Instagram filter they used to shoot J-Lo in that movie was... Oh, yeah, was, it was... She filter, <laughs> It was like, yeah, filter it's Like Barbara Streisand was jealous yeah. of that glow. Uh, yeah, I don't... Uh, I don't know. As I, I think, yeah, you saw the potential in Soderbergh's Out of Sight. Mm -hmm. You saw the potential in Selena. But eventually, along the way, you start to believe your own hype. You start to hear all this stuff. You hear all these diva rumors. I don't care how much PR she does to try to turn that rumor around. Too many people who've worked with her on sets say how much of a bad person she is to work with on set. And that bleeds into your performance. That bleeds into being helped on camera, being helped with editing, being all this kind of jazz. People have little access to grind. And, they, and production is, a, is who you don't want to piss off when you're doing a movie. And I think... She hasn't been hungry to do really well for a long time. And it also may be that she's not being offered these parts where she can possibly shine. Like Isn't she, she on a TV show now? Like yeah, that dark blue or whatever it is. Something like Shades of blue. Shades yeah. of blue. Shades I, of blue. I, I it got say, a second season. I will say this, and you can take it as, it as for what it is. She's a better actress than she is a singer. Yes. Oh, yeah. shots fired. <laughs> wow. Well, she's got her Vegas show, right? You can't auto-tune acting. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I just think she's Jenny from the block, mm -hmm. and I would love to ride. I'd love to ride Squeaks over Squeaks. to her place. No, oh, yeah. I'm no. My no. transforming scooter right over to J Lo's house. I'll be the boy next door. Sure. Hey, oh. you can think about how many women you can pick up riding Squeaks. You yeah. know, oh, absolutely. Is it a little weird for a 35 year old man to be a senior in high school living next door to J Lo? Sure. Don't ask questions. Just let me have my dream. All right. What's next? LV426 LV426 <laughs> tweets with Jurassic World bringing dinosaurs back to the forefront do you think we will get more movie adaptations of other dino titles uh, it's hard to think of another dino title I was just gonna say I that, don't know uh, if I can think I mean look yeah, my one of my favorite movies of all time is a horrible movie and it is Planet of the Dinosaurs you're never gonna see that movie <laughs> remade again it's great check it out trust me everybody at home watch Planet of the Dinosaurs it's terrible in <laughs> the Ugh. best way possible <laughs> but Jurassic ever since Jurassic Park came out in 93 you had Jurassic Park and then you had a bunch of knockoffs that were trying to be Jurassic Park the closest you ever came to like a real huge big budget dinosaur kind of movie 
was the horrible 98 Godzilla version mm -hmm. where you had a bunch of velociraptors running around Madison <laughs> Square Garden. You also had a pretty cool dinosaur fight scene that was very unnecessary in Peter Jackson's King Kong. Yeah. So as far as a standalone dinosaur movie, it's so synonymous with Jurassic Park in that universe. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you can do another one. Ooh, The Land Before Time. They should reboot that. <laughs> what the, but they did reboot it. Yeah, that was Land sucked. of the Lost. Oh. And they did Land well, of the Lost. Well, there's like Land of the Four Time has like 47 oh. sequels, yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. literally. Yeah. And it's like their grandchildren's grandchildren at this point. But the originals were so good. Yeah, it was mm. good. I, I you that. Can you reboot an animated franchise? I, have we ever seen that before? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you're doing it with Transformers, so, you know. No, an animated friend, like into another animated friend. Yeah, they're doing the Transformers 87. Now we're going to have a new Transformers animated universe. Dude. Are they really? Get on no, board, on, man. Oh, wait, as a movie or dude, as a TV scooters series? Scooters are going to abound yeah, left yeah. and right. <laughs> oh Ciao. Ciao. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think if you don't have that top tier, like a Jurassic Park, the dinosaur thing yeah. ends up being kind of cheesy. It, it's It's like... I love dinosaurs, don't get me wrong, but if you don't have the budget, <laughs> if you don't have the budget for it. I don't want to piss off yeah, the dinosaur yeah. lobby. Oh, man. I'm a big fan of dinosaurs. You used to see the people go after. Uh, Some T-Rex like rips the roof off. Yeah. I was like, what do you say, yeah. Dennis? We those, cool? Uh, hey, those stegosauruses, they're pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but I, I just don't think if you don't have the budget to actually do it correctly, yeah. it just ends up being really really bad. Dennis, it's your birthday, yeah. so you should get to answer this question. Did What's I your... hang out with the dinosaurs back in the day with Roka? <laughs> no, 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 nobody's Don't that old fun. except, no, no. of course, they were the great caveman. friends. You know, Roka's original name was Grok, and then he <laughs> upgraded from being a caveman. What's your What's your favorite dinosaur of all time, Dennis? Uh, I had to say the Triceratops. Really? He's pretty badass. Have you not seen a T-Rex? T-Rex is cool, but I always felt the Triceratops is the guy that could take him down. Just He's got those three spikes on his you know, he does have the spikes. Yeah, the ran right has into, yeah he's got yeah. the little arms. Yeah. Triceratops. All right. Broca, who who did oh, win in those fights? Crap. <laughs> 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 yes, Stegosaurus. I just want a Brontosaurus burger now. I'm thinking of Flintstones. I want a Brontosaurus burger. <laughs> Put one right on the side. Wilma! No, uh, how, how do Brontosaurus burgers taste? They're really good. <laughs> Tastes like chicken, surprisingly enough. No, uh, for me, uh, T Rex. I don't think anything's okay. going to beat the T Rex, no matter what they try to. Hash up in those Jurassic World movies. T-Rex is the best. <laughs> All right, let's do two more. All right, Dario tweets, do you think we might get an official title for epi episode eight at Celebration? Yes. Um, I think you are, yeah. I think that you might even see, as we talked about on Jedi Council yesterday, they showed some footage of episode eight. You heard me right. They showed some footage of episode eight at a Vegas convention for licensing. So very select few people have seen some wow. of those pics already or some of the even like a scene or two. So you might see like a teaser teaser trailer at Star Wars Celebration in a few weeks. And I think you will get a title. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's no doubt they'll get a title. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, all right, last one. Slime Y'all tweets, do you think the new Halloween films, I don't know why he said it like that. I don't know, I don't know why that happened. Do you think the new Halloween films will tell different tales like Season of the Witch? I already have Michael Myers fatigue. Uh, I'm not the right person to answer this. I have uh, no clue. Is Rob Zombie involved? Then Rob no. Zombie is not involved. Thank God. No. Thank God. Caesar the Wit. Is, I th oh. That's the Halloween 3. That thing yeah. just goes completely off the rails mm -hmm. in some glorious directions and some really questionable ones, too. Yeah. I think that the Halloween reboot is going to be done right. I know yeah. John Carpenter is going to be peripherally involved with it, but mm -hmm. yeah. he's probably just cashing a paycheck. Having said that, you can look at the horrific track record of them trying to reboot either a Friday the 13th or a Nightmare on Elm Street. I think with Halloween, obviously they're going to open it around Halloween. It's going to be that big movie maybe it does launch a new franchise i'm just saying that this new halloween movie that they're going to do i think they're going back to basics i think they're yeah. going to get it right yeah i think you're right mark and and there's so much to explore in the franchise like if they did if they do it right there's so many avenues to go to with halloween you can have michael myers versus a t-rex that's right <laughs> all right let's do one more all right cassie says in honor of dennis's birthday best movie centering on a birthday worst movie about a birthday Ooh. Oh, great Man. question. Happy birthday, Damn. Dennis. Looking good. I forgot that part. All right. Damn. 
You know, if, if you're talking about celebrating a birthday, so the movie has to center around the celebration of a birthday mm -hmm. in some form. Could, could be, be really good, good. Could be really bad. I would bring up Problem Child. I believe there was some yeah. sort of awful birthday that happened in one There's of those. There's a birthday party, right? There's a birthday party. Junior ruins a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, he really just should be put out of his misery. I'm going to go with, as far as a good, positive birthday celebration, uh, they didn't. They never did one with old school. That was more like, mm. uh, that was more like Luke Wilson's character being I free from the confines of his previous relationship. So as far as celebrating, there was a good birthday scene in old school. There was. That's when Stifler accidentally shoots Frank the Tank with a dart. So I'm going to say that's one of my favorite birthday scenes in movie history. Frank the Tank. Uh... <laughs> I would say 16 Candles, duh. Yeah. 16 Candles is fantastic. Oh, good which, one. If you've seen Central Intelligence, they do a great job referencing <laughs> that movie. Uh, and I would say Project X. Project X is oh, awesome, off the chart, crazy film. Totally works for me every time I see it, based on a birthday. So awesome, and I, I can't recommend that movie enough. It's, it's a, a found birthday. footage comedy yeah. based around birthday hijinks. It's, it's a noble effort. Yeah. But... It's really good. It's better than Sandlot. They, they tried really hard. It's better than Sandlot. I cheated and looked up a couple, but um, <laughs> Harry Potter, obviously, the first one, Sorcerer's Stone. So oh, that's yeah. he's um, taken to Hogwarts on his mm -hmm. 11th birthday. And then um, the other one is Toy Story, Andy's birthday present. Oh, yeah. You want to know the saddest birthday scene in history? There was a movie with Jodie Foster, and I can't remember the kid's name, uh, called The Little Man Tate. Yeah. And this kid, he was just kind of like an outcast in school, and he, he finally gets up the nerve, and it's his birthday's coming up, so he makes all these birthday invitations, and he's handing them out at recess, and he's handing them out to the kids. I'm going to start crying. And then the bell goes off for recess to end, and all the kids run back into school, and they all just throw the invitation. Oh, my oh, So gosh. he's standing there by himself at recess with all of his invitations on the ground. Oh. God, never do that. Be friends to somebody. Oh, my yeah. God, it's awful. That's Happy a... birthday, Dennis. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'll think about that later tonight. We're all going to your birthday party tonight, uh. which I believe is going to be held at Medieval Times. Is yeah, that yes. where we're going? Yes, Medieval Times. Me, me and Jim Carrey yes. are going to be hanging out. But they had battling. Pepsi. Uh, for me, I can't think of an actual movie, but the scene that stands out to me is uh, the in Uncle Buck. When John Candy makes the giant uh, pancakes oh, for Macaulay yeah. Culkin. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. Haven't seen the new TV show. Probably won't watch no. it, but love John Candy. Liar Liar is good, too. 13 going on 30. Ah, yeah, very good. Films, yeah. All right. All right, guys. That's it for today's episode. I want to thank you guys for joining us. I also want to thank the people joining here at the table. Roka, where can people find you? Hey, guys. You can always find me at the Roka Says on Instagram and on Twitter. You can find me here uh, one more time on Sunday night hosting uh, the Game of Thrones recap show with Dennis uh, Perry Nimeroff and I think Jonathan as well. Yeah. Okay. So the, the gang will be back together for that. Uh, and also, starting on June 29th, uh, the Top 10 show is here on Collider Network on video. Uh, I'm so looking forward to showing you guys the show and seeing what you all think. Uh, Matt Nost, one of, one of the funniest guys I know, he's going to be introduced to the Collider family, which I'm so excited about because he's so great. I think you guys will enjoy the show. Give it a chance. We just count down the top 10 films of whatever film is coming out that week, a theme from whatever film is being released that week. And uh, on June 29th, we count down the top 10 Spielberg films in honor of BFG coming out that week. And uh, there will be some interesting omissions and some interesting <laughs> additions. So please tune in and yell at us as much as you like. Uh, Mark Ellis? Jaws better be in that list, my friend. <laughs> I am a huge fan of Mr. Roca and Matt Nose. Make sure you guys check out the new Top 10 show. You can check out Christian and I as we host the movie trivia showdown later on today and this weekend. I'll be at the World Famous Comedy Store Saturday night. I'm making invitations. I'm handing them out. Please do not throw them on the ground because <laughs> I will weep. And Sinead, where, where can people find you? You can find me online at Sinead DeFries and at ThatSoSinead.com. On Mondays, here hosting TV Talk. On Fridays, Movie Talk. And over the weekend, on Mailbag. Also, Wendy, where can people find you? Oh, you can find me at <laughs> Wendy Lee Zane. I was making sure my mic wasn't mute. At Wendy Lee Zane, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero or Instagram Dennis.TZNG. You can subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos. I'm going to get out of here now and drink some. Uh, I will see you guys <laughs> next Happy time. birthday to <laughs> you. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.